first of all, I'm going to share Kim's sentiment and say how much I love our neighborhood. Um, I wanted to have an event in our neighborhood that highlighted all these wonderful relationships, the closeness of our neighbors, the economic vitality that we have in, in our small, cloistered little um, place of Logan Square that drew Brett and me here um, 21 years ago, almost, 20 years ago, and, um, and the relationships that we've had with all of you. Um, and of course, it's extraordinary to listen to Kim and hear I promised Betsy and David that we would hear some uplifting words um, and, and words of empowerment. And certainly, he came to us, but from our neighborhood. Um, we know each other from the parks. We see each other walking our kids to school. Jason, thank you for basically adopting Maya, for adopting my, my daughters. And, and Yvonne, of course, for basically being a second mother, perhaps the first mother. <laughs> this is our neighborhood. It's amazing. Um, and I really want to thank him for an amazing talk that really just kind of gives us a moment to breathe um, and realizes what we can do. So I ran for city council, thanks to all of you here, you helped bring me in. But I ran for city council because I fundamentally believed in the power of municipal local politics and particularly politics at the grassroots to shape the boundaries of how we have political discussions. We're never going to like every single decision that's being made on a certain level. But what I think the public does, most importantly of all, is to be able to shape the boundaries around which conversations have to happen. You don't go here. Um, you don't say it's okay to have vouchers. You don't imprison people at atrocious rates based on their race. You don't um, cut out cash assistance for the poor. Um, we don't leave people homeless uh, without regard to their welfare. Um, or any of that kind of stuff. We shape the boundaries for political conversations and politicians and the rest of the political process can be this messy process of how we arrive specifically at the compromise that we want. But we want everybody to know, you don't cross these bright lines. Um, and I think we need that more than ever, as Kim has said, that these moments of what is at stake in our nation and what we continue to debate about constitutional freedoms, civil liberties, human rights, are all up for grabs again um, in ways that are profoundly surprising, disturbing, but should all call all of us to consciousness about the role that we play. And I think what, what Kim said so beautifully is that the Constitution is a living document in the sense that it, it, it can be changed and it, can, it, is, it is always changing and evolving its understanding of it. <laughs> But it's also a living document in the sense that we have to enact it. Uh, we are all actors in the process of creating um, a constitutional democracy, creating the form of politics that we want. And it's a moving target. And it's not a fixed, or nor is it a linear process of always going up or always going down. It's up to each one of us in this moment to really push on that. I came out of a history of doing that. Public education communities um, who fought for 17 years under a state takeover that labeled our schools as, well, what Donald Trump is talking about them right now, essentially. Um, and we pushed back against a narrative that talked about public institutions as being failing, not worthwhile, that talked about primarily uh, minority children and immigrant children as not uh, deserving of the fullest access to their educational opportunities. And it was parents, and it was educators, and it was the students themselves, and the communities and civic organizations in this city that for 17 years worked together to change that narrative slowly and surely. Um, and, you know, it, we toppled a governor whose name we don't even have to say anymore <laughs> um, because he was the first governor in Pennsylvania history not to be elected again, and largely because our message had not just been in Philadelphia, but we had spread it across the state that if you take away public education, a billion dollars worth of it, and you don't offer any solutions or alternatives, a repeal and replace, if you can uh, <laughs> draw an analogy, um, you're not going to get reelected. And that is the boundary that we can't cross again. And then you swept the following year in 2015, we brought in uh, a new mayor facing off against millions of dollars in outside money from voucher advocates and um, others uh, who were promoting a far different vision of public education. And then someone like myself, a first time candidate, a woman, an Asian American, you know, running a, largely on the energy and the civic power of this. And we won um, in city council and our municipal politics. 
And in the last year, I think what we've been able to do is see what a difference it makes. You know, we in just the area of education, we put back full-time nurses and counselors in every school. We got hydration stations in, we drove town halls, and we're continuing the energy to be able to shape it. But, you know, now as November 9th kind of hit, um, it's even bigger. And I hope that what you see in someone like myself and in the community that's in this room is a commitment to understanding that we're not going to slow down. We're not going to stop and we're not going to hold, we're not going to stop holding people accountable nor ourselves accountable for what the power that we have to do, our obligations and our responsibilities today. And as Kim said so beautifully, nothing was more amazing to me, probably one of my most extraordinary experiences, than what happened at the airport on, on the January 28th weekend when the executive order came down on the seven, uh, seven Muslim countries, basically. Um, and you know, we got a call from the mayor's team uh, that there were a number of families who were in imminent danger of being deported. Two families had already been returned to their home countries with nobody present at the airport. And the mayor's team was you know, essentially afraid that that was gonna happen again for these other communities. So you know, I'm like, I don't know, what can we do, really? So we're like, I don't, hey, if you're free, we really need you at the airport. Um, this is happening right now, and we need people to come. And the most amazing thing was that people came by the hundreds. Folks in this room came. Um, Marcos, thank you. Christine sent out to all your networks, and others um, came by the hundreds on Saturday night. And because we were there, a U.S. Senator came, and then a U.S. Congressman came, and then you had state reps come. And this executive order, it's important to understand, came down in the middle of the night while planes were still in the air. And it's not like Trump, Bannon, uh, Miller, whatever that whole cadre is going to do, is going to go out there and do the dirty and hard work of enacting the ideas that they hatch behind closed doors. They're going to de deploy it out to Customs and Border Patrol agents by the thousands who are completely uncertain what this order means. They're watching CNN. They're looking at things. They don't know how to interpret any of this stuff. So left to their own devices, we saw people being strip searched. We saw people being returned, green card holders sent back, people being detained for hours on end, military heroes and others. Um, but then something different happened. When people started coming out, when we called the people out, when those five families were there at the airport, um, to have that many people come out, suddenly Customs and Border Patrol isn't making their de decisions in a vacuum. Suddenly the public is out there saying, we need to hold this up. Um, and you know, you've got lawyers and you've got all these other people working together. You, you've got the media, we've got everything moving. And then you know, they decide to hold then an Eastern District Court judge is there until 1, 2 a.m. in the morning that issues a stay on any kind of deportation. And the next day, thousands, by tens of thousands, we had 7,000 at Philadelphia Airport alone, um, thousands came out of airports all across the nation. And the Muslim ban falls. And it doesn't mean that it's perfectly linear, and I'm not saying it's completely causal, but that these two things have something to say about our agency, our power, and our obligations in these times. And whether it is about immigration or whether it's going to be about health care, we have a lot to do. And, um, you know, in myself, I think I'm somebody who understands how to come out of movements, not based on, well, I've always been in power and I'm going to remain in power, but from people who've traditionally not had power. And so if you traditionally don't have power, we have to exercise these extraordinarily levers that we do have. We have to be creative, agile, we have to be loving, we have to make connections bigger and broader than we've ever had before. And we can't stop. And we have to think about things over the long term. Um, that's what I'm committed to. That's the history I come out of. Many of you know me from public education, but I bring that energy and that spirit to a lot of things in this city. And whether it's about civil liberties and freedoms or an anti-poverty message, um, we're gonna keep going at it. And I know that with the loving power of people in this room, specifically in our neighborhood, in the end, we're gonna see tremendous change. Um, and the most important thing is that we'll be shaping it. And that's what I think it means to have uh, a nation that we don't only call our own, but we make our own. So. Okay.
Thank you.